Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to IC Series, our afternoon program. It's now 2 o'clock, and we're very excited to be uh, presenting here at the 2 o'clock hour a little information on the Dawn mission. Uh, the Dawn mission has just arrived at Ceres and is uh, in orbit around Ceres. And to give a little bit of an overview of the Dawn mission, uh, we've invited Dr. Mark um, Raymond from the Jet Propulsion Lab. He is the chief engineer and also the mission director. So, Dr. Raymond. Thank you very much. I appreciate your coming and hope everybody's had fun looking at all the cool exhibits outside and I hope you enjoy the discussions this afternoon. So I'm gonna tell you about the Dawn mission and as you know, this is a NASA mission run by JPL, uh, which is uh, operated by Caltech where you all are right now. But there are many organizations around the country and indeed around the world involved in this project, including UCLA, here in Southern California, and many other organizations as well. <laughs> but before I start talking about Dawn, I want to give you a little bit of context, take you back in time, and talk for just a moment about what astronomers knew about the solar system a couple of hundred years ago. So this is a sort of conventional view of the solar system, looking down with the sun in the center and the orbits of the inner planets here. Here's Earth, <laughs> Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And this is pretty much what astronomers knew about the solar system in 1800. They knew about some moons of some of the planets and occasional comets, but mostly this was it. And in fact, even this picture was a relatively new one because Uranus had only been discovered in 1781. So the same picture could not have been drawn 20 years earlier. The inner planets, of course, from Mercury to Saturn were known even to ancient astronomers. Now for fun, although I'm showing you the, the planets that were known in 1800, I'm showing you their locations today on May 9th of 2015, which is why if you're here on Earth, which is where all of us are and perhaps some of the people watching on Ustream are as well, if you imagine Earth rotating counterclockwise, then you can see that when the sun goes down, Jupiter is high in the sky, and I hope you've been enjoying the beautiful sight of Jupiter in our evening skies, and Saturn is opposite the sun, and so it's up most of the night in the constellation Scorpius. It's also why it's not a good time to see Mars, because it's opposite the sun. At any rate, this is what astronomers knew in 1800. And then along came this fellow, Giuseppe Piazzi, a mathematician and astronomer, and he got the new year off to a good start. He discovered a new planet. I mean, modern astronomers had only ever discovered one planet, Uranus, and so this was quite a significant finding. And I'm going to show you a high-resolution photograph of what Mr. Piazzi discovered. She's here, Ceres. <laughs> the Roman goddess of agriculture and grain. And she's often depicted with her crown of grain here and her harvest bounty. And in this, this artist chose to depict her with a scythe. Different artists use their own choices for what to show for different farm implements. But there's always some, some agricultural tool shown. And in fact, if you had cereal this morning, then you owe a debt of at least etymological gratitude to Ceres. So this is what Mr. Piazzi discovered. And now this is the same chart I showed you just a moment ago, the planets as they were known in 1800. And here are the planets as they were known in 1801. And so Ceres fit very nicely into the gap between Mars and Jupiter. And for much of the next half century was considered to be a planet like the others. Well, then along comes this character, Heinrich Wilhelm Olbers, who was trained as a physician, but was a fantastically productive astronomer. And the very next year, he discovered another new body in that part of the solar system. But more importantly, for what I want to tell you about for the Dawn story, in 1807, he discovered still another new object between Mars and Jupiter, what by then was the fourth new addition to the solar system family. And this is what the good Dr. Olbers discovered. She's Vesta, the Roman goddess of hearth, home, and family. It's interesting, Vesta is rarely depicted in art. And uh, when she is, she's often, she often has this very stern look on her face. But one of the things that I think you'll discover in the presentations this afternoon is that the solar system place, Vesta, is a much happier place. And relatively little is known about how she figured into Roman mythology because she was worshipped privately in the home. 
So anyway, this is what Dr. Olbers discovered. And now here's the same view where I've zoomed in a little bit. So now Jupiter is the outermost planet. And you can see Vesta also fit nicely into the gap between Mars and Jupiter. And so these two bodies, along with two others that I'm, I'm not showing you, until the middle of the 19th century were often described as planets. And uh, once again, I'm showing you their locations today. So now that we can see where Venus is, you can also see that from Earth's standpoint, Venus is relatively far from the sun, which is why in the early evenings these days, you can see the brilliant glow of Venus in the western sky. Well, by the middle of the 19th century, as science and technology advanced, more and more and more bodies started to be discovered in this part of the solar system. Until now, it's looking something more like this. And I will invite the people who are here in the front to confirm for those of you who are in the back who can't see as well that I've added 10,320 individual dots <laughs> to this chart to show you the location of that number of asteroids today. Now, we know about many, many more asteroids than that. I'm only showing you the ones that are larger than about five miles or so in diameter, because if I showed you all of them, Vesta and Ceres here would be, just be lost in this yellowish green mass. But what this shows us is this part of the solar system is very different from the inner solar system here. And in fact, we can get this perspective to see there's clearly something different about this part of the solar system. And so that raises the question, why is that? Why is this part of the solar system different? Well, you're a great audience. I appreciate your asking that question. <laughs> and the reason I'm glad you asked is because the next part of my presentation is to answer it. But to do that, I have to take you back in time a little bit before Piazzi's 1801 discovery of Ceres. In fact, I have to take you back to the dawn of the solar system. Get it? I'm telling you about the dawn mission. <laughs> so this is a view from the Hubble Space Telescope of a large interstellar cloud of gas and dust that has in it conditions much like those we believe led to the, the formation of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. So off the top of the picture, there's a brilliant star shining down on this cloud of gas and dust. But up here, there's a knot of material so dense that it's actually blocking the light of the star, preventing it from pushing this gas and dust away here which is why this is sticking out of the cloud like a finger. And deep inside here, it's so dense that the material is starting to collapse under its own weight, and eventually will grow so dense that it will form a star. And that's how our star, the sun, formed, again, almost 4.6 billion years ago. And once you form a star, you can begin to form planets, because now you have this swirling cloud of debris and occasionally, particles in there will collide. Now, sometimes when they collide, they'll break apart. Other times, however, when they collide, they'll stick together. And we can actually see that happening with two particles here that hit and stick, and another particle sticks to that, and another particle, and another particle, and another particle. Now, on the chart, they grow larger to form words. But in space, they grow larger to form rocks. And eventually, these rocks grow so large that their gravity can pull in still more material, and then you can form planets. And that's how the planets of the inner solar system, including one right underneath our feet, formed more than four and a half billion years ago. However, the story is very complicated, but in brief, when massive Jupiter formed, its gravity was so intense, it interrupted this process depriving the material there of the opportunity to continue growing into full-size planets. And Ceres and Vesta are sometimes called protoplanets, or protoplanetary remnants of that epoch, because they were in the process of growing to become full-size planets, but were deprived of the opportunity to continue growing. And Dawn's mission is to fly out to the asteroid belt and study these objects in order to learn about the dawn of the solar system. Okay. And dawn and the other missions that you're going to hear about this afternoon are part of an ambitious set of programs, projects, that NASA is undertaking in order to learn about the solar system and even beyond. Now, I think when most people think of asteroids, they think of sort of chips of rock, right? The size of buildings or mountains. But uh, let's see, we're having a little bit of trouble here with the, here we go. I mean, um, but. These are very different 
bodies. Vesta has an equatorial diameter of 350 miles. This is huge. It's got one crater near the southern hemisphere that's 300 miles in diameter with a mountain that soars to more than two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. So it's entirely unlike the size of other objects, other asteroids that spacecraft have visited. And in fact, if we bring Ceres in, you can see it's still of a significantly different scale. So we can put this size into a different context by comparing Vesta and Ceres, where now, as I mentioned, this is 350 miles in diameter. Ceres is about 600 miles in diameter. These are very large. In fact, in my view, these were among the last unexplored worlds in the inner solar system prior to dawn. This is the largest asteroid that a spacecraft had visited prior to the dawn mission. So we can compare them with other objects, and you can see they're really more like much larger places that you're familiar with. And this afternoon, we're going to be lucky enough to hear not only about dwarf planet Ceres, but also about dwarf planet Pluto. And one of the things that's so exciting about this year is these two dwarf planets are both being explored by spacecraft that NASA is operating. And I think that makes 2015 a, a really exciting year. Now, I want to give you an overview of the mission that we've got. So we departed from most people's favorite planet in September 2007. And we started out with a big rocket. I threw that in just to help keep you awake, even though maybe you couldn't even hear that. On our way out to the asteroid belt, we flew by Mars, robbed it of some of its orbital energy around the sun in order to help propel the spacecraft on its way, and in order to keep the solar system's energy uh, accounts balanced. Mars had to slow down in order to speed up the spacecraft. And so uh, if you've been paying careful attention to Mars, it now goes around the sun more slowly because dawn flew by. And so it has slowed down at a rate of one inch per 180 million years because of dawns having flown by. <laughs> so we arrived at Vesta in July of 2011, went into orbit around it. The spacecraft then spent 14 months studying this alien world in great detail, scrutinizing it, making all sorts of wonderful measurements. And then we left orbit around Vesta in September of 2012 and traveled then to Ceres, which we reached just a couple of months ago, where Dawn is orbiting now. And at each object, we make a comprehensive set of measurements. We photograph the surface. We're all visual creatures, and you like to see cool pictures. We make topographical maps. We take pictures in stereo at different angles so we can see what the full three-dimensional character of the surface is, which is how I was able to tell you how tall one of those mountains is. We map the elemental composition. That is, what are the atomic constituents of these bodies? What kind of atoms are there? And the mineralogical composition. How do these combine to form different sorts of rocks and minerals? We also measure the gravity field to determine the interior structure how are these bodies organized inside? And you'll hear more about that uh, in a short time from Carol Raymond. And we search for moons. So we really make a comprehensive set of measurements. But this brings up an interesting point. Dawn is not only the only spacecraft ever to orbit an object in the main asteroid belt, but it's also the only spacecraft ever to orbit any two solar system deep space destinations, which when you think about it is kind of a surprising thing. I mean, this is a sort of mission scientists would want to undertake. Go to some body, study it in great detail, and then go somewhere else and do the same thing. And yet in more than 57 years of space exploration, this has never even been attempted prior to the Dawn mission. I mean, it's not as if nobody ever thought of it. It happens in science fiction all the time. Go to some planet, do whatever you're going to do there, you know, beat somebody up or make out with them, and then go to some other planet and do the same thing. And yet this has never been attempted prior to Dawn. And so that's sort of a curious fact. And it raises the, raises the question, why is that? Why is that? Well, again, I'm glad you asked the question. The reason is because until recently, engineers were confronted with a problem. They were confronted with the same problem as these two fellows. That is, they just haven't had the technology to carry it out. It turns out a mission to go to a different, distant destination, go into orbit, maneuver in orbit, then break out of orbit, fly someplace else, and go into orbit around it, is far, far, far beyond the capability of conventional chemical propulsion. So a mission like this would be not just difficult, but truly impossible, impossible with conventional propulsion. 
So at JPL a number of years ago, some of us got together and asked the question, how can we travel around the solar system more easily and less expensively? And our answer to that is to use ion propulsion. Now, if you're like me, and I happen to know some of you in the audience are, the first time you ever even heard of ion propulsion was in science fiction. First time I ever heard of it was in a Star Trek episode. This, of course, is from Star Wars. This is the TIE fighter that Darth Vader and the evil empire used to fight Luke Skywalker and the members of the Rebel Alliance. And in the Star Wars universe, the TIE fighter stands for twin ion engine, because this was one of the most futuristic, coolest, advanced technologies that George Lucas could think of. And to me, one of the rewards of working on a project like this is getting to turn that science fiction into science fact. And so this is a view of the Dawn spacecraft. And in fact, this is what it looks like right now as it's operating its ion propulsion system in orbit around dwarf planet Ceres. And it's doing this at this very moment. And without this advanced technology, again, this mission would be truly impossible. And you can see, this is a photograph of an ion thruster operating in a vacuum chamber at JPL, just seven miles or so from here where I work. And it really does produce this cool blue glow like in science fiction movies. The reason is because we use the gas xenon, which is like neon, sort of a chemical cousin of it. Xenon just happens to glow blue like neon just happens to glow orange. And this system is 10 times more efficient than conventional chemical propulsion, which means we can undertake missions that are much, much more ambitious and yet still be very affordable. This would be like having your car get 300 miles per gallon. Now, although it's very efficient, we only use a very small amount of xenon at a time. And so the thrust is also very, very gentle. In fact, I'm going to do an ion propulsion demonstration here for you. And this is pretty safe. You can probably do this yourself at home. That is, the ion engine pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this single piece of paper pushes on my hand. And yet, in the zero gravity, frictionless environment of space, gradually the effect of this thrust can build up. So at today's throttle level, it would take Dawn f 10 days to accelerate from zero to 60 miles per hour. It doesn't exactly evoke the concept of a hot rod. But instead of thrusting for 10 days, if you thrust for a month or a year, or as Dawn already has for five years, you can achieve fantastically high velocity. And so this is what I like to call acceleration with patience. And it's really the key to what allows us to undertake a uniquely ambitious mission. And it's, it's that that allows us to explore these two uncharted worlds, which would otherwise be virtually impossible to study. So that's the ion propulsion. Now, because my time is so limited, I don't have the time to give you the entire history of ion propulsion. So let's just get back to the Dawn spacecraft, which you can see here in an artist concept. And the first thing you notice is it's dominated by these huge solar rays. At the time we launched the spacecraft in 2007, this was the largest wingtip to wingtip span of Na any NASA interplanetary spacecraft. 65 feet, that's the distance from a pitcher's mound to home plate in a professional baseball field. And in fact, it's, the spacecraft is so large, some of you who thought I was going to hang out my laundry earlier today when you saw me with the string, we were measuring the width of the auditorium. The spacecraft is so large that it would not actually fit between the two walls here. Uh, it would only go if we had this at this wall over here. The other wall would be right here. We couldn't fit the entire spacecraft in. And the reason it's so large is because we're going far from the sun. Sunlight is weak, and so we need a large area of solar cells to capture enough light to produce electrical power to operate all of our systems, including the ion propulsion system, which is power hungry. It takes a lot of energy to ionize and accelerate xenon. And for scale, this is our main antenna. It's five feet in diameter. Here's one of our ion engines. Here's a second ion engine, and oh boy, there's a third. So we actually do the Star Wars TIE fighters one better. This is the spacecraft when it was being built in a clean room here on Earth. And this is one of the solar array wings. This is another one. And of course, they had to be folded up because you can't fit a 65-foot wide spacecraft inside the nose cone of a rocket. And these are some of the sensors that we use, some of the sensors here that we use for studying the character of Vesta and Ceres. And this is one of our ion engines. 
there's a one foot diameter metal grid here that has 15,000 little holes through which we shoot xenon ions. And the xenon is stored in a tank in the center of the spacecraft here. And because I mentioned xenon a few times, I thought I'd show you a photograph of xenon. So this is actually my chameleon xenon, who because of his uh, bluish green color has kind of a cosmetic affection for, uh, for ion propulsion. And he gets a kick out of being included in my public presentations. So when I go home tonight and tell him a bunch of people at Caltech got to see a picture of him, he's gonna think that was really cool. So here's another view of the spacecraft. This is the main spacecraft here. Some sensors up on top, our five foot diameter antenna. This is Tom. And this is one of our two solar array wings. Each wing at 27 feet is the width of a singles tennis court. This is a very large spacecraft. But again, we had to fold it up to put it inside our rocket. Here's a view of the launch. We departed from Cape Canaveral uh, in September of 2007. And in fact, we launched dawn at launch. You can see the sun in the background there. And then once we got up into space, this is our trajectory. So we're again, conventional view looking down on the solar system with the sun in the center. Here's the orbit of Earth. And this is where Earth was when we departed. And as we follow along the trajectory, you can see where the spacecraft's trajectory is this nice uh, xenon blue color is when we're thrusting with the ion propulsion system and where it's dark is where we're coasting. So we launched and spent some time coasting and checked out the ion propulsion system and checked out some other systems and did various tests here, but then got into a pretty regular routine of thrusting most of the time. Then we had a long coast period here during which we flew by Mars in order to slow it down and speed us up. And then we continue ion thrusting to gradually spiral away from the sun, getting farther and farther and farther until we caught up with Vesta in July of 2011, went into orbit around it, stayed with Vesta as Vesta orbited the sun. Then we departed from Vesta in September of 2012, began a long climb from there, an arduous mission to Ceres, which we reached a couple of months ago, and the spacecraft is now there. And so in fact, we can zoom in and see where the spacecraft is today. It's right there, and on the scale, Ceres is at the same location. You can't see the difference. We can also zoom in and see where Vesta is now. Dawn used to orbit it, but now it's even farther away from Vesta, much farther away from Vesta than the Earth is from the Sun. And as long as we're zooming in to see where things are, we can check out to see where Earth is. So we zoom in, there's Earth, and oh boy, what do you know? Actually, there we are in Beckman Auditorium. Now, when you look at a picture like this, it's flat and it's static. And it's easy to forget that the solar system is in motion. I like to think of it as the solar system having this big, beautiful, complex choreography, which you lose in a picture like that. And so let's take a look at an animation. But just to get ourselves oriented first, here in the conventional view, this is the sun in the center. This is the orbit of Earth. Here's Mars. This is Vesta. And this is Ceres. And it's starting out showing you their positions in March of 2007. And we didn't launch till September. But that will let you follow along with Earth here as we get to launch, and there's the spacecraft departing, heading for Mars. Now, Vesta's gonna make one full revolution before we get there, and Ceres will make two. Here, the spacecraft is flying by Mars, turns on its ion propulsion system again, heading for Vesta, but we won't get there till here, and Ceres is gonna go all the way around again before we're ready to reach it. But in uh, the summer of 2011, the spacecraft got to Vesta, went into orbit around it, then stayed with Vesta for 14 months as they continued orbiting the sun, and then in September of 2012, it lit up that ion propulsion system again and started propelling itself towards Ceres, but it's a difficult climb to get there, and so it has a long pursuit until it reaches it down here. But in March, it did get there after a journey of more than seven and a half years and 3.1 billion miles. It got to Ceres, is in orbit around it now, making a really fabulous set of measurements there, and that's where the spacecraft will be for essentially all time. So that's sort of a broad overview of the mission. Uh, and here's just another view of Ceres and Vesta, and you will hear more about these from Carol Raymond during the panel discussion this afternoon. So again, this is a broad and brief overview of the Dawn mission. There's a lot going on uh, all the time. The project's very busy. I'm not gonna bore you with every imaginable detail of what we're doing. 
Instead, I will just thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate your letting me tell you about the Dawn mission, and I hope you enjoy the panel discussion this afternoon. So we have just um, one or two minutes before the panel discussion, so I'll take maybe one or two questions if anybody has any, but then we want to get going with the panel. So yeah, and if you could step up to the microphone, the organizers here would appreciate that. First, I think it's incredible that you could create a device that would work for that long in such a in harsh environment and work perfectly. That's impressive. Well, thank you. Um, and what you'll hear from the other panelists or the panelists this afternoon is Dawn is just one of many NASA missions that have really fabulously long lifetimes in the hostile, forbidding environment of space, accomplishing in many cases far beyond what, uh, what you might imagine they'd be capable of doing. So I, I agree with you. It's very impressive. I agree. So my question is, why did you choose these particular asteroids as opposed to some of the other large uh, minor planets? These are the two most massive objects in the main asteroid belt. And you'll hear more about this, I think, from the panelists. But uh, in fact, many, many geologists or planetary geologists don't even call them asteroids. Again, they're protoplanets. They were growing to become full-size planets. And Vesta is more closely related in a geological sense to bodies like Earth and the other terrestrial planets than it is to just the chunks of rock that people normally think of as asteroids. It's not to say that they're, I mean, they're all fascinating. They all can tell us a great deal about the nature of the solar system. But these were chosen because they uh, are these sort of transition objects between the little asteroids and the full-size planets. And you'll hear more about that from Carol Raymond in a short time. Um, I think we probably shouldn't take more than one more question because I want the panel to be able to start at 2.30. So you were up, why don't we take that question and then I'll turn it over to Emily. Thanks for your talk today. You're um, welcome. In the animation that you had, uh, it appeared that the orbital inclination of Vesta and Ceres were tilted. How, how much are they off the... Uh, Solar system disk. OK, so the, just to clarify, the, this question is correctly pointing out that when we saw the animation, um, most of the planets in the solar system orbit in pretty much the same plane. And Earth's plane is called the ecliptic. Most planets are in that plane. Vesta and Ceres are tipped. Vesta is tipped by about 7.1 degree, a little more than 7 degrees. Ceres is 10.6 may not sound like much, but for reasons I don't have time to explain now, it is very, very expensive energetically, very difficult to tip the plane of a spacecraft's orbit. And because we're orbiting Vesta in series, not just flying by, we have to get Vesta into the same plane that those bodies are in. That is very, very difficult, but the ion propulsion system is well up to that task. So thank you again. Stay for some cool fun here.